that delivers all of that. We have a system now, and we'll talk about some of the challenges of that system, but I want you to imagine how that system might look in the city of tomorrow. And we saw some pictures this morning, and um, it was sort of highlighted how people were absent from those images of the city of tomorrow, in many cases. And I've done the same thing, and I've presented images of the city of tomorrow that you can find on the internet. And they also lack any kind of delivery system infrastructure, generally speaking. Okay? Generally, they have people walking, and they have people sitting in cafes, and there's no evidence there's been any kind of planning for any kind of goods movement system, and that, that's just infeasible, right? So we're going to talk about what that system can look like, how it needs to be different uh, from how it is today, and I've got three wonderful panelists. Uh, on the far side there, we've got Kevin Vasconi. He's the uh, Executive Vice President and CIO at Domino's Pizza. Uh, Daphne Carmelli in the middle is the CEO and founder of Delive. And Laura Richards is a transportation planner with the District DOT. Uh, Domino's, and I love this example because it's one of the things I think you probably haven't thought about before, uh, is how a company like Domino's plans for and effectively manages to deliver orders, pizzas, right, in probably less than half an hour. Actually makes the pizza and then delivers it. Think it and for me, it's a, an astoundingly complex logistics problem that happens without you really noticing it. So he can tell us a little bit about the technology that they use and his future state for how they're going to continue to use technology to do that work while existing, coexisting with sustainable, livable city environments. Uh, Daphne uh, is the CEO of Delive. Delive provides new last mile delivery solutions, enabling companies to meet customer expectations, which are you know, increasing daily in terms of the shortness of time between order and receipt of goods, but also the very narrow time window that those goods are delivered in. She's allowing companies to do that, which is very difficult, but also thrive while doing that. Uh, and Laura, representing the district DOT, there are not many departments of transportation who are able to see goods movement and delivery services as an asset in their city. I would say that at the current time, most DOTs think about trucks as a, a liability, as an obstacle, as a uh, something that makes their environment less enjoyable. And that's, that's problematic because they're essential and they're necessary. And there are, there are some cities around the country uh, who are able to um, see that delivery actually enables city living. Right? If we want people to live in a less car-dependent way, if we want people to take more trips walking, more trips cycling, more trips by transit, they have less capacity to do that last mile delivery themselves. Remember when I lived in London, it's a long time ago now, uh, and we would walk to the grocery store, and we'd walk home with our bags of groceries, and it wasn't that far, I don't know, three quarters of a mile, but we eventually stopped buying anything to drink besides wine. I, 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 did, I stopped by, you know, there's no juice, there was no sparkling water. Because trying to carry that home was, was too much effort, right? And that's just drinks. I also remember when we lived in Paris, seeing a guy bring his futon onto the subway, right? Because if you don't have a car, you sometimes need to move large obstacles, or you, and you're going to need a delivery system more than you need it when you have your own vehicle, especially a very large vehicle. So they've been able to see that. They've been able to see that delivery services and, and waste removal is an essential city service, and they want to support that rather than hinder that system so that we can live and enjoy the urban spaces that we have. So I'm just gonna ask each of them to give a brief uh, introduction to themselves. Laura? 
Great, hi, I'm Laura Richards, Freight Transportation Planner for Washington, D.C. And I'd like to thank Ford and you all uh, for having me here today. I also am very excited that we're here talking about um, goods movement and delivery. So I, again, manage goods movement for Washington, D.C. We are a mid-sized city, so we have about 660,000 people. And every weekday, we welcome about half of that in commuters. And then that doesn't count any of the many tourists and visitors we receive. So that's a lot of people. Um, and I believe we're now the sixth most congested city. So on top of that, we are a city of consumers. So we like to buy things. We don't make them, we buy them. And being a built out urban area, we have one option for those goods and getting those goods to people and market right now, and that is trucks. So we are 99% last mile truck delivery in the district, which causes a significant challenge. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to sit here and speak with you all about what we've been doing and then other possible solutions for that. Hi, I'm Daphne Carmelli, uh, CEO and founder of Delib. And thank you very much for allowing me to participate. What an honor to be part of this event. Um, we are the nation's leading crowdsource-based last mile delivery and returns business. Uh, we power close to 5,000 businesses across the country from the largest national omnichannel retailers like a Macy's or a PetSmart or a Best Buy or an Office Depot, uh, the leading e-commerce uh, providers, whether it be Google Shopping Express or meal kits like Plated uh, or grocery like Fresh Direct. Uh, thousands of SMBs and also we power um, in a number of ways for UPS, one of our investors, uh, deliveries for them also last mile. Um, you hear a lot about delivery, uh, it's not new and there's a lot of players out there. Just to put a context about what we do and what we don't do um, is really differentiated by our business model. Um, we are not a marketplace. You don't download a Delive app. You don't go to a Delive website. You don't buy anything from Delive. Um, instead, we're the guys that you're going to bump into when you check out of a retail or a commerce site. Just like uh, PayPal might be an option for payments or UPS and FedEx might be an option for ground shipping, Delive would be that option for same day. Um, we're also not the on-delivery guys. You're hungry, you want your burrito, and you want it within 30 minutes, or you want your pizza in less than 30 minutes. That's not us. Um, what we've learned from our experience, uh, particularly when it comes to retail, is that predictability uh, trumps speed in terms of a value proposition. Knowing specifically when you're going to get something and have the flexibility to change that or change the destination becomes highly, highly valuable. Um, and then the last thing we're not is we're not a capital-based company. We're in fact completely capital asset free. We don't own warehouses, we don't own trucks, we don't own airplanes. Our drivers are completely on-demand independent uh, contractors. So think of us as an asset-free UPS or an asset-free FedEx. Um, that gives us the control, flexibility, and predictability and a cost-effective solution to be able to uh, deliver uh, now and uh, into the future. Hi, I'm Kevin Vasconi uh, from Domino's Pizza. We're the world's largest uh, delivery company for pizza. Uh, just to give you an idea of the, what that means from size and scope, we've got about 14,000 stores in 70 countries. Uh, and we, in the United States, will deliver about 3 million orders per week out of 5,500 stores. Uh, we use bikes, we use e-bikes, we use scooters, we use e-scooters, we use cars. Uh, and actually, a couple of years ago, we actually built a special vehicle just to deliver pizza to really kind of optimize uh, that experience. Uh, we're uh, obsessed with delivery and the future of delivery, um, and it really is core to our business uh, and it's core to our relationship with the consumer. And as Daphne said, what, if you compare and contrast us, I think probably the biggest difference is we have a perishable product. We have a very finite amount of time to deliver that. Um, which brings its own challenges uh, with it, which I think we'll talk about some of that today, especially in an urban environment. Thanks. So before we jump into some questions for our panelists, um, 
I want to emphasize a couple of things. One is that often when people think about freight, in particular when they use that word, or they think about goods delivery, they think about big 53-foot semi-trucks, they think about mile-long heavy haul trains, they think about big intermodal port facilities. That's not the system that we're going to talk about today. We're talking about the system that brings food, that removes waste, that brings medical supplies, that brings pencils and office supplies to you in an urban environment. Um, I think the other thing people um, overlook is that the delivery system is, is not just about moving vehicles into and around the city. The, when a truck parks, and I use truck because that's largely what we use right now, it doesn't have to be. Um, once a truck parks, the, the act of delivery has really just begun. And the delivery, the truck parks, and it's generally the driver, he gets out of the truck, right? And he walks to the back of the truck and he opens it up and he finds his package and he gets his dolly, baby, puts it on the dolly, gets up the curb, walks along the sidewalk, enters a building, takes a freight elevator to the 72nd floor, finds the receiver, gets a signature, and then he has to come back out again. And so the act of delivery is, um, is much more than the question of how do we you know, move vehicles along streets or give them curb space. And that's been an overlooked area of the delivery system, in my view, and one of the things that I've spent a lot of time researching. So I hope I've made the case that the goods movement system is essential. You cannot live in a city without that system. So we should be thinking about how it works and planning for it to work better than it does today. It's also very costly. So this last mile of delivery that was referred to, um, you'll see different estimates, but sometimes it's estimated that 25% of the total delivery cost of a good is incurred in that last mile, and they use that term you know, generally, it's not literally a mile. That last piece of the delivery system is where you lose all your abilities to consolidate, right? And those efficiencies that you might find in a logistic system sort of dissolve. You also have to operate on, on someone else's infrastructure, right? Um, a company like Amazon can, can run their own distribution center just the way they want Right? with just the people they want, just the resources, but they can't control the cityscape. And they have to use shared urban infrastructure that has other uses and other objectives. And that that's becomes a very difficult environment to sort of operate in and, and manage and control. Um, the delivery system is changing very rapidly. You all know that because who right now is buying something that's gonna be delivered to their house? Be honest. <laughs> okay. We buy stuff in meetings, um, and it's going to get you know it's going to get delivered to your house probably by the time you're there. And four years ago, that was impossible. Okay, so it's changing very rapidly, and that changes what transportation demand we will see. And these cities that they're trying to operate in, you know, San Francisco was designed a hundred years ago for an entirely different set of demands and transportation requirements. We're trying to use those cities to respond and adapt to this new requirement. And that's, that's, that's difficult and it requires some work. Um, it's also complex, and, and by that I mean there are many, many stakeholders. So we have three here today you're gonna to hear from. Um, but when you talk about the delivery and actually entering a building, right, you have, have engaged the building manager um, the building owner, we have carriers like UPS and the Postal Service who actually conduct the act of delivery. Those, that model is changing as well. We have new, uh, more contract-based delivery companies. Uh, we have shippers like Domino's or Costco who require goods to be moved. Um, we have consumers that are part of that system and their requirements change the way that system works. We have city governments like the district DOT who set rules and policies and provide that infrastructure that they operate on. We have vehicle manufacturers, building designers, transportation technology companies. I mean, it's an immense and not orchestrated system 
uh, that we're trying to influence and trying to, to move to a better future state. So that's a very difficult thing to do. So I'm going to pose some questions to our panelists, and I think at the end we'll have some time for questions from you. Um, but my first one is, uh, and I'll just ask that each of you respond to each of the questions. Uh, what are your frustrations or aggravations or sort of main points of conflict with the current urban goods delivery system? Um, so I think that actually I'll reiterate what Ann just said, which is that from a city DOT perspective, one of the big frustrations and challenges is this diversity and delivery, right? So I'm the freight transportation planner for the district, and that's what my task is. But what does that mean? I mean, that means all commercial goods and deliveries, right? So down to the pizza you're having delivered, all the way to, you know, concrete being delivered to a construction site. That's a big array of different types of vehicles, needs, uses, space, safety impacts, infrastructure impacts. It's a lot. Um, and then even with that large area of um, different pieces of the puzzle, there's a real lack of data and information um, within the freight industry right now. So for a lot of the other different types of transportation in the city, we have an idea of the demand, right? Or we have resources to be able to figure out the demand. But for urban freight, we're just now starting to quantify that. So when we're looking at new developments and changes that occur every day throughout the city, we don't know what that means with respect to deliveries, any of them. Um, and we're getting there, but there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of information that's needed, and there's a lot of players involved. So it's, you know, can we get the information? And are people willing to share the information? Do we collect it ourselves? There are these great data sets, but they don't necessarily translate to the granular level that we have at a city. Um, you know, it doesn't help me to know all of the through in the district. I need to know exactly where trucks are traveling, when and why, and maybe even what's in them, because that changes their, um, I guess, behavior as they're moving in and throughout the district. So that's a big challenge. And then I think because of all of that, we have a lack of understanding by all the people making decisions and driving these demand generators, right? So um, because we don't have all of that information, how would someone know that the corner store coming to their neighborhood is going to bring a 40-foot beer truck that's going to really frustrate them every morning and barely be able to make the turn to get onto that street and not have a loading dock to load and unload because we're a built-out urban area and we don't have the space to provide that in you know most developments so what what do we do with that and how do we communicate to people what to expect how we can best plan for it um, and what their the impact their decisions will have on them and um, how do we tell other people that might not necessarily be at the table or bring them to the table so they're aware and so their concerns or the impact they'll experience is considered as well because Ultimately, we're not moving these goods for no purpose, right? This is a circle. So, you know, you're a resident, you live next door to a store, you're annoyed at the truck, but you probably go to that store for other things. So we're all really working towards the same goal, which is to facilitate uh, getting goods to the people who want them. Uh, it's just a matter of doing that best and with the least impact to the most amount of people. So getting the information um, and then also education, I think, are two of the big frustrations that we experience as a DOT working with commercial goods movement. Um, the way we think about that, um, where there's no shortage of aggravations and frustrations, is I think about all the stakeholders kind of in the value chain of what we do. Uh, so starting with um, the consumer, um, I mentioned we're not the on-demand delivery guys, we're the scheduled delivery guys. Um, the reason being is the most frustrating thing for a consumer is coming home and seeing that dreaded yellow sticky on your door that you missed that delivery. Um, so, you know, we try to provide solutions in order to do that, but that's still a very, very big frustration. Uh, similar to that, or a sister to that, is you get a confirmation that a delivery was made and you get home and it's vanished. Um, that's a frustration. Um, we then think about the next stakeholder and that's the driver. 
um, as part of the innovation and the disruption that we're making, um, we are not uh, the drivers with the commercial uh, plates. So one of the very, very large frustrations for drivers is parking. Yep. Parking to pick up the items, parking to deliver the items, either they can't find it, um, that might risk delays and they're responsible for holding to SLAs, or they do find parking, they get back and there is a ticket. Um, then the drivers have frustrations with fundamental congestion. Um, drivers are paid across a whole number of different settlement ways, but at the end of the day, productivity utilization is a core to what they make. So delays and congestion at the end of the day end up hurting their wallets. Right? Then we think about the retailers, their frustrations. Whatever you do, they don't want the stuff coming back. Right? You try to be able to schedule it, you try to be flexible and give customers the opportunity to change where they are and so forth, and every retailer has different operating procedures of what to happen. Um, a luxury good provider might have an SOP of if they're not home, you want to try to call them or try to re-deliver, otherwise over a certain value amount, bring it back. And then there's the you know, 1-800 flowers of the world. Whatever you do, don't bring back the flowers. Find a place to put them. Right, um, and then you think about the city. There's congestion. There are these big trucks. There's pollution. Right, so there's frustrations across the value chain. The good news is it gives an opportunity for all of the private and public sectors to come together to really help solve these in the future. Yeah, no, excellent points. Um, I think uh, just to take a broad swipe at it. You know, cities were just barely designed to move people. Uh, and as we've talked about and was talked about this morning, they are definitely not optimized to move packages. Uh, you know, we talk about the last mile, I talk about the last hundred feet, right? I mean, getting the product out of the vehicle and to the consumer in an urban environment is extremely challenging. Uh, and we use a lot of technology to do that. We use a lot of uh, extra labor to do that. So it's not the most efficient process. But the, the thing I would ask everybody to think about, the thing we're thinking about, because we do a lot of deliveries and urban areas are great markets for us, is as the world becomes more autonomous, it's going to get harder, not easier. Um, there, we talked also today about curbside management, right? Um, I, I probably have drivers in my system today that will double park uh, to make a delivery, uh, but an autonomous vehicle is not going to double park, right? Uh, I don't know a single city planner, present company accepted, that's thinking about what about autonomous delivery zones, right? And as Daphne said, uh, that's only half the problem because I still have to load the product. So I need a place to load the product, I need a place to deliver the product. Uh, it's hard today and our big concern is it's just going to get harder. So we really do need a partnership uh, between vehicle manufacturers, between the city and between technologists to kind of try to figure this out. So one of the analogies I've heard about sort of our current system is that it's like you designed a bus, a transit system, but you didn't plan for the stops. Yeah. So that's sort of what we have today. So enough griping about how things